Okay, welcome. My name is uh, Ken Peters, and I'm a petroleum geochemist with interests in basin and petroleum system modeling. I am with the uh, Basin and Petroleum System Modeling Industrial Affiliates Program at Stanford University. And this is the second in a series of six lectures uh, on the use of uh, petroleum geochemistry in basin modeling. These are abbreviated lectures uh, that will be shown to our PhD candidates in the BPSM program. But they'll also be shown to uh, our affiliates and we wanna thank our affiliates uh, for their continued support of uh, our program. Okay, so today we're going to follow up on our previous talk on origin and preservation of organic matter. We're gonna talk about vitronite reflectance. This is uh, probably the most commonly used uh, way of describing uh, thermal maturity of uh, of rock samples, and it's even used in the industry to describe uh, the maturity of fluids uh, by means of equivalent vitronite reflectance. It's also very important because we use it both as input and as calibration for our basin models. So it's important that we understand vitronite reflectance. I think many modelers uh, don't have a working knowledge of the strengths and the pitfalls associated with vitronite reflectance. So that's part of the purpose of this presentation. We're going to start off by um, looking at uh, some strew mount slides. This is transmitted light slides of some organic matter under the microscope. You can see here we have on the left some amorphous oil prone organic matter. I know this is oil prone because uh, in UV excitation, ultraviolet excitation, this amorphous organic matter fluoresces very strongly. It's very oil prone. There's some pyrite framboids in there as well, but uh, this is a good oil prone source rock that will generate oil and gas upon uh, thermal maturation. The other extreme, we've got uh, structured gas prone organic matter. Uh, this sample actually has a polynomorph here and it's got uh, some vitronite particles, this structured vitronite, little pieces of uh, what was once wood. Uh, these, are, these are vitronites. And there's some inertinite in here as well. The dark colored particles are mostly uh, inertinite. And of course, uh, we can have any mixture of the different types of macerals uh, in a source rock. Uh, here's a mixed source rock. It, can, it contains both amorphous and uh, structured uh, organic matter. In fact, this is a little piece of wood right here. You can see the cellular structure at low maturity. You would call that humanite. Uh, and eventually, uh, at reflectances values uh, more than about 0.2%, we would call it uh, vitronite. So let's look at uh, the way that this, uh, these different types of organic matter were originally characterized. This is called a Van Crevelin diagram. Uh, this was uh, used more uh, frequently in the past than, than now. It plots the atomic H to C versus atomic O to C ratio of the kerogen isolated from different uh, types of uh, rocks, different types of source rocks. Uh, and you can see there are four pathways here that are shown. And we have basically three major types of, uh, or groups, uh, macerals. These are macerol groups. The liptonites, there are a lot of different uh, macerols, individual macerols. These are just some of them, alginite, spornite, cutinite, resinite. And uh, these have a lot of hydrogen, which is great for making oil and gas, hydrocarbon gases. The vitronites are uh, lower in hydrogen content. And, you know, colonite and telonite, these are, uh, these are vitronites. Uh, this is a, a where one sample that we analyzed plots. It's a uh, coal from Utah. A coal is by definition greater than 50 percent, 50 weight percent organic carbon. Coals can be uh, any combination of lip, of uh, macerals. This particular coal is 5 percent liptonite, 75 percent vitronite macerals, and 20 percent inertinite macerals. And then we also have another. Uh, macerol group, a very large group of inertinites, 
and the, the name here hints at what these are like. They don't generate much of anything upon burial maturation. Now, uh, all of these uh, were showing pathways that head down toward the origin of this graph. Uh, this is a graphitic or graphite sort of composition down here with very little oxygen uh, or hydrogen. Right? So the hydrogen is expended in making uh, the, the hydrocarbons that are generated. A very important point is that a kerogen, any kerogen can plot anywhere on this graph, right? So there are all kinds of different mixtures and it doesn't necessarily have to plot on one of these paths. The paths are just for descriptive purposes. And of course, these paths are maturation pathways. Now on the right here, I'm showing you three different types of microscopy, organic petrography. Uh, the top one here is uh, under UV excitation. It's a, it's a, a cross section through a whole rock uh, from the side. And you can see it's uh, got minerals in the dark here but it also has compacted algal organic matter. There's some, uh, this looks like pyrite here, but there's some compacted algal material, probably mostly Tasmanites in this particular sample. So that's uh, fluorescing. These are all fluorescing, uh, very oil prone uh, material. This is another type of uh, organic petrography. This is transmitted light microscopy, where we're looking at light coming up through the sample. This is actually a little piece of uh, humanite or wood. You can see the cellular structure and there's some pyrite framboids in there as well. Uh, it's uh, difficult to get the pyrite out of these samples to concentrate the carriage and of course uh, for this elemental analysis that must be conducted is a, is a, is a time uh, intensive and tedious process involving hydrochloric acid to remove the carbonates hydrofluoric acid to remove the silicates, sometimes uh, some ultracentrifugation or some centrifugation to remove some heavy minerals. Uh, and the product is kerogen plus ash and some, uh, some pyrite. Uh, and it takes a lot of sample and a lot of time and effort to do this. Um, this is another type of organic petrography. This is reflected light uh, uh, microscopy under oil immersion. And this one actually has a has an inertinite particle right here. This is a uh, this is a, a fungal hyphae, and there are also some uh, sort of uh, large pieces of what looks like vitronite or different types of vitronite, possibly some solid bitumen in here as well. And the the dark, of course, is epoxy that's holding this kerogen concentrate together under the microscope. Well, this uh, Van Crevelin diagram was used. But of course, it takes uh, a lot of effort to put a sample onto this plot. In the uh, sort of mid 70s, the uh, Institut Francais du Petrole came out with the Rocky Val and Rocky Val pyrolysis. This is open system pyrolysis. You can generate a pseudo Van Crevelin diagram, very similar to the Van Crevelin diagram, except it, uh, it requires only about 100 milligrams of sample as opposed to many grams of sample. And uh, it can be done in about 20 minutes per sample. No isolation of kerogen is necessary. You can see here in the Van Crevelin plot, I've included uh, vitronite reflectance, sort of uh, typical values of vitronite reflectance through here. You can see the reflectance increasing as you get more and more mature. And also the thermal alteration index. Here's some values for the thermal alteration index with maturity. But look at these two graphs. If you look here, you've got eocene Green River formation, uh, very oil prone, sort of type one organic matter. And it's uh, also indicated here. Uh, here is, uh, you know, the uh, Jurassic from the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Hanifa Hadria source rock. And you see it plots on the type two pathway, the oil prone pathway here. And then we have the type three pathway, which is more gas prone. The Blackhawk coal is a coal that plots a little bit anomalous here in terms of hydrogen index, but basically you can get very similar results uh, with a very rapid screening technique that we call Rocky Val pyrolysis. We'll describe Rocky Val in more detail later, but I wanted to introduce the Van Crevelin diagram. Vitronite reflectance is a key thermal maturity indicator, and uh, uh, it has several characteristics. First, uh, vitronite is a mass rule derived from woody plants. So the 
what we're measuring is the percentage of incident light. We're using 456 nanometer uh, monochromatic light, and that's reflected off a polished surface of the vitronite under oil immersion. So the, the knot here represents measurement under oil immersion, vitronite reflectance. This is usually reported as mean or average reflectance value. Uh, however, sometimes if people have a, a microscope stage that can be rotated, uh, it turns out that vitronite can be anisotropic uh, at higher reflectance values at say 1% or so or more. Uh, it it uh, shows higher reflectance as you rotate the stage and then lower reflectance. So uh, they will report maybe vitronite reflectance max, the maximum reflectance for a particle. Uh, this is very important right here, the histogram. Uh, the histo histogram with the standard deviation should be available. You, you, uh, many geologists, when they build a model, they'll use the reflectance values as a, from a table. And you don't want to do that. You want to have a histogram available. You want to have uh, information on the number of phytoclasts that were measured to get that reflectance value and the standard deviation of the measurement. Very important to include. Right here is a sort of output from a basin and petroleum system model. The vitronite reflectance here is calculated based on the burial history, the geothermal gradient, the lithologies, their thermal, uh, their thermal conductivity and so forth. And this is uh, then the vitronite, calculated vitronite reflectance using uh, uh, some kinetics from Sweeney and uh, Burnham and Sweeney from 1990 it's called easy percent R naught. It's a common uh, way of doing uh, maturation calculation for vitronite reflectance. There may be better ways of doing it. We'll describe those a little bit later. But this shows that uh, in this burial history that uh, we had a, some sort of heating event or deeper burial starting around 50 million years ago, a little, a little older than 50 million years ago. And the present day uh, reflectance is up around 2%. And here we have the four uh, principal elements in the source rock and the underburden really isn't that important to us. What's important is the overburden, the seal, the reservoir, and the source. Now, one thing I want to, this is really an important slide because one thing I want to make very clear from the very beginning here is that there's a difference between maturity and generation parameters, right? If you measure vitronite reflectance, you're measuring maturity measuring the maturity based on the, uh, uh, the kinetics of the conversion of vitronite, of humanite to vitronite of higher and higher maturity. Uh, vitronite comes from higher plants, right? But what, what uh, generation parameters are indicating is transformation ratio. That is the proportion of the generative capacity of the carrageen to make oil and gas. Okay, so the transformation ratio is a generation parameter and the kinetics for that are different because this is, uh, this is the liptonite that's making these, uh, making the oil and the gas. This is higher plant material. So the kinetics are different. These are sliding scales, right? They slide relative to one another. I could have shown you dozens of different uh, plots of R0 versus transformation ratio. I'm just going to show you three. These are Lawrence Livermore standard type three, type one, and type two kinetics. And we just plotted those. This is from Waples and Marcy. Doug Waples plotted those uh, as a function of transformation ratio. So there's no unique uh, or general universal relationship between reflectance and TR transformation ratio. That has to be determined on an individual basis for each basin, for each source rock. Once you determine that, yes, you can predict transformation ratio from the reflectance and vice versa, but that's a, an independent thing for every source rock that you'll look at. So maturity, yes, maturity parameters, you can seriatim rank samples of rock by which is more mature, which is less mature, but the relationship to the generation timing uh, is not clear cut and they're, they're basically sliding scales depending on the organophases of the carrageen. So here are some slides. Uh, these, uh, these on the bottom here are uh, vitronite reflectance slides. Uh, 
uh, you can see that the pterogen has been isolated and it's been put into a plug here with epoxy and dried. Here the epoxy and the kerogen have been mixed and put onto a slide. Uh, and again, we'll polish each of these using a fine grit and immerse them in immersion oil and measure the reflectance. Now for a thermal alteration index, that's a different measure. We're measuring not the bitronite, now we're measuring spores and pollen and we measure their color in transmitted light. So this is not reflected light, this will be transmitted light through these slides. These are independent measures of thermal maturity based on organic petrography. Now, I just thought I would show you some examples of what vitronite looks like under the microscope. Uh, I learned my vitronite reflectance from Neely Bostic at the USGS many years ago. And I asked Neely one time, what is, uh, what is vitronite? And he said, well, it's the low grade. So <laughs> uh, here is a nice particle of vitronite, nice big piece of vitronite. And it illustrates uh, some, of the, some of the issues uh, related to vitronite reflectance measurements. When you make a measurement, the photometer measures, there's a uh, field diaphragm, a fixed diaphragm, that an aperture that closes down to about a 10 micron spot. It's slightly variable depending on the instrument. But a 10 micron spot, that's a 10 micron spot right there. So you will measure the reflectance of that spot. Now, if you look at this, Particle, this phytoclast of vitronite, there's some places where you wouldn't want to make a measurement. For example, you wouldn't want to make a measurement along this scrape. This, is, uh, this occurred during polishing of the sample and something, a little bit coarser piece of the grit, basically dug a little canal along here and it's lower reflectance because of that, right? And also here you can see that this is a very common thing. The vitronite has uh, different levels of reflectance, slightly different levels of reflectance. So even within the vitronite group, there are differences in the reflectance. There's telecolonite, uh, there's colonite, telecolonite, and they have slightly different reflectances. So I'd make a measurement here, maybe a couple other places here, and then move on to another phytoclast for the next measurement. This is, this is basically a very nice sample. The one on the upper right here, though, is, uh, is not a nice sample. This is the sample from hell. And these are fairly common. Uh, in a dozen samples, you might have eight that look like this, and then a couple that look like this. So you can see this is a ratty sample. There are pits uh, in the, in the uh, polishing process. This actually is not isolated carriage, and this is a whole rock mount. And uh, you can do that. Uh, you can see here's some pyrite, really highly reflecting pyrite. Uh, this, this material right here is probably liptonite. It's probably liptonite macerol. Uh, there are other populations here that could be described as vitronite, but you can see they have different reflectance values. So this is one of the issues is the microscopist has to pick what they think is the vitronite. Is it this, which is higher reflectance than that? And then this has a different reflectance still. So this is a tough sample. One way to approach this is that when you supply samples to the analyst, you, you supply them in depth order, right? So you, you, you give the analyst an advantage in that he knows, well, I've got five samples that generate a trend here with depth, and then five samples below this one that generate a trend, and those trends connect, and I can interpolate which of these is the true vitronite in this really tough sample that's intermediate between these in terms of depth. Here's another uh, vitronite, piece of vitronite, nice big piece of vitronite. You can see the cellular structure here in the woody material. You would make measurements inside those cellular uh, places and then move around the slide to get multiple uh, vitronite particles. Here's another uh, preparation. This is a carrageen preparation. Uh, this is actually a nerdonite right here. Uh, that's a, a fungal hyphae, and uh, the epoxy is the low reflecting material in between. And you've got these fractured sort of uh, vitronite-like materials here. Some of them may actually be solid bitumen. You've got to be careful about that. And uh, some may be indeed uh, vitronite. So it's, uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily all that straightforward uh, selecting uh, vitronite in some cases. 
That's why it's important to look at the histogram. This is a reflectance histogram based on, you want at least 20 phytoclasts, preferably 100. Uh, this was uh, an analysis of a single rock sample uh, where the uh, kerogen was isolated, and now we've got 55 measurements. The average reflectance was 0.74. So most source rocks enter the oil window about 0.6% reflectance, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. This one is in the oil window then. But what does this mean? What does this standard deviation mean? Most people look at this and they think, well, this is, this is good. It's, uh, it's, it's you know, high, you know, high level of confidence in this number because the standard deviation is so low. What this is in reality is a measure of the repeatability of the microscopist's eye to select what he or she thinks is the vitronite. Okay, so they're going through the slide manually looking for the low gray that they think is actually the true vitronite. They may pick the wrong vitronite or the vitronite macerol. There are multiple macerols in there. They might pick the wrong one. They might actually pick a completely different macerol and be completely wrong. So this is a little bit deceptive, but it is uh, comforting to know that there were statistical measures, a uh, number of samples, and it's a fairly nice uh, distribution. If you have vitronite reflectance data for samples where there were only five or 10 vitronite phytoclasts measured, those are highly suspect data. So don't just go to a table and pick out the vitronite, single vitronite value for a given depth. Have a look at the, uh, at, the, at the statistics as well. So what's going on here? What actually is probably happening here is, uh, this is this is kind of an artist's depiction of what uh, a kerogen might look like, a low maturity humanite or vitronite in the kerogen. You can see it's a three-dimensional structure. Uh, these are sp3 hybridized carbon uh, covalent bonds. So it's a three-dimensional structure. One way of showing that is for cyclohexane on the side. You can look at it. This is the chair conformation of cyclohexane. You can see it's a three-dimensional structure. Yes, there are other things in there like oxygen and sulfur, but this is uh, this has low reflectance under the microscope. An enhanced specimen, a lignite, low maturity coal is going to look, you know, sort of like, like mud. It's going to be low reflecting. On the other hand, a high mature coal like anthracite is going to have high reflectance. And the analog here would be a benzene ring where you've lost six hydrogens from the cyclohexane. And you look at that from the side and it's flat. So what you're seeing here is a rearrangement of the carbon structure. You're going from sp3 hybridized carbon to mostly sp2 hybridized carbon with double bonds delocalized electrons, and you get these large aromatic sheets that begin to orient themselves parallel with each other, and they're sort of held together by van der Waals forces uh, among the hydrogens that, that still are poking out. Um, yes, if you have a pencil, you can write a pencil across a piece of paper. Uh, it's not pencil lead that you're using there. It's actually graphite, which is highly mature. Uh, carbon, yeah. And what you're doing is you're sliding these polyaromatic sheets off, you're breaking the van der Waals bonds, which are very weak, and you're sliding this, uh, these polyaromatic sheets off onto the paper. In more detail, if you really look at this, uh, the reflectance depends on the difference in refractive index between the vitronite and the immersion oil that you're using. So here's a, here's a light wave coming. We use a Normally use 546 nanometer monochromatic light in the uh, in the in such microscopes, and you can see that some of that light is going to be reflected back according to Fresnel's law. Now, for normal incidence on a polished surface, yeah, uh, this is Fresnel's law, where N1 and N2 are the refractive indices of the vitronite and the immersion oil. Okay, this is a, a slide courtesy of Alan Burnham, who's also a co-principal in uh, BPSM. And uh, uh, he went to the, uh, uh, the uh, physics uh, 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 book and looked up uh, solids and liquids, organic solids and liquids. 
Yeah. And you've got basically a relationship between the hydrogen to carbon ratio and the refractive index of those solids and liquids. As those solids and liquids uh, uh, contain lower and lower amounts of uh, hydrogen, they become denser and the refractive index rises. So this isn't a maturity plot. This is a plot that just shows us a whole series of liquids and solids, organic liquids and solids, uh, where the density uh, is, is increasing as the hydrogen content uh, is lower and lower and lower, and that increases the refractive index. So one way of thinking of this is that loss of hydrogen from the vitronite will result in increasing density and increasing refractive index, and therefore an increase in vitronite reflectance. So here's, a, here's an example from a basin petroleum system model. Uh, the Sweeney and Burnham calculation, there's an activation energy distribution, sort of a global activation energy distribution, a frequency factor for conversion of uh, vitronite, yeah, for the increase in reflectance of vitronite. It's called easy percent R naught. And you can see it's calculated here for this particular model. This is an extraction from a 3D model at, at one location, test well number one. And this blue line then is the predicted reflectance with depth at that location based on the input that you, the basin modeler, have given the model, the geothermal gradient, the thermal conductivity of these different rock units, uh, the geohistory, uh, and, and so forth. So the calculation then is, is, this is calculated what it should be. And these are now the measurements that were made at that particular, in that particular well. And you can see they don't agree. So this, uh, this model needs to be calibrated. It's not yet calibrated. And uh, so now you have, the modeler has to decide what to do. And uh, many times you look at the the uh, curve and how do you move that curve? Well, one of the quickest ways to move it would be to alter, for example, the, uh, to reduce the heat flow. Heat flow, paleo heat flow is generally not all that well known. Maybe reducing the heat flow by two milliwatts per square meter or so will bring this closer to this fit and you can calibrate the model and have something that's more useful. Well, here are some advantages and disadvantages of vitronite reflectance. First of all, it's irreversible. So if your rock is uplifted and the uh, top is eroded off, that reflectance that was imposed on that rock at depth will remain. So it's gonna keep the uh, re high reflectance value that it had because of high maturity, even though it's been uplifted to the surface. Uh, reflectance is pretty much insensitive to rock composition. Uh, there's some caveats to that we'll discuss in a minute. Uh, reflectance values cover a wide temperature range uh, in geohistory, and vitronite is present in most sedimentary rocks. Got to watch out there a little bit, though, because in some of the best source rocks, uh, for example, uh, the Hanifa Hadria in Saudi Arabia, that was deposited on a carbonate platform hundreds of kilometers from the nearest higher plants. So in some rocks, uh, there is little or no vitronite. You can't trust it because there's not enough. And of course, uh, it, since vitronite comes from higher plants, if the rocks are older than Silurian, they're not going to have any vitronite either. So uh, the big disadvantage of vitronite is that, well, it's difficult to identify sometimes, but also there's no age specificity, right? So if you have caving in a well, <laughs> I'll show you some caving in a minute, you're dropping uh, um, lower maturity vitronite from higher in the well down into the well bore before it's been cased. And you're mixing that lower maturity vitronite with uh, the vitronite at the depth you're currently drilling. So that's a contaminant. And your organic petrographer is not gonna be able to identify that as a contaminant because vitronite uh, from the Jurassic looks just like vitronite from the tertiary. So that's, uh, that's a limitation. This is one of the reasons why it's always good to look at multiple parameters when you try to identify the level of thermal maturation. TAI, or the Thermal Alteration Index, is a great way to do that. You can look at spores or pollen. This is a bisaccate pollen. And these are bisaccate pollen from different levels of maturity. You can see the uh, 
the color in transmitted light goes from sort of a yellowish regeneration or immature light brown to more of a dark brown and then black. Right? So there's a color change that sort of parallels the incre increase in vitronite reflectance of, you know, the reflectance of vitronite. And so there are two independent measures of thermal maturity, both of them organic petrography. Be careful, uh, in old company reports, there are different types of scales that are used. This is the, the Stapleton scale of TAI. It's a one to five scale, and it's color changes in transmitted light uh, of these spores and pollen. Uh, the spore coloration index is another one, a one to 10 scale. Same sort of thing, you're looking at the color in transmitted light. Now, as you might guess, this is an imprecise and subjective uh, approach. Uh, what's, uh, what's light brown to one person might be <coughs> medium brown to someone else. One way that people try to get around this is that they will look down the ocular in one eye and in the, uh, in the other hand, in the hand, they'll have a, a collection of color, uh, color coded templates, right? So they'll pick the color and try to, try to make it less subjective. Of course, light source variations can affect the color and the thickness of the spore pollen grain will affect the color too. Also turbo drilling, can artificially heat the sample. So these spores and pollen are subject to that. Uh, also, uh, we, we're generally not, uh, we generally don't have a lot of samples uh, of uh, spores and pollen. Appropriate microfossils are rare in some rocks. Most samples are not gonna contain more than four or five polynomorphs that you can measure for TAI at any given depth. Uh, long ranging microfossils are good. Why? Well. Uh, we can tell the age of various microfossils. A good palynologist can do that. And that's why it's good if you find a good palynologist, keep a hold of that person because there, there are fewer and fewer good palynologists out there. Many service companies use someone straight off the street to measure reflectance and to measure uh, spore coloration. And that's, uh, that's, that's dangerous because uh, if you know the species of the microfossil you're looking at, you can identify contamination and you can uh, make the measurements more consistent with each other. Uh, low sensitivity in the peak generation, inaccurate in immature and post-mature zones. Well, a black spore is more mature than a dark brown spore, but you can't tell how much more mature. It's just black. Uh, this is the power of TAI that, doesn't, that you don't have with vitronite reflectance. Polynomorph age with a good palynologist, you can describe the age of the rock. And you can identify the age of the unit. You can identify whether the polynomorphs are caved or recycled or indigenous. And that's important. That helps. So uh, this is an example of uh, you know, multiple uh, explanations for, you know, always keep your mind open for the, the level of thermal maturity. Uh, I like to tell my students, don't trust anything. Don't trust anybody. Uh, always look at multiple parameters to support your interpretation. Here are two organic petrographic approaches. Uh, confidence in the masterful identification. Yes, you know what a trilete spore looks like. But, you know, your confidence in the maturity assessment uh, could be poor. Might be okay, but it could be poor. On the other hand, a, photo, a photometer, a you vitronite know, reflectance uh, microscope, is really excellent for measuring uh, very accurately the amount of light reflected, but you might have misidentified the vitronite particle. So here's a recommendation to keep in mind. Provide the samples to the analyst. If you're sending samples out for uh, organic petrography, give them to the analyst in depth order. If it's a tight well, you can always uh, you know, add 50 meters or something to the, the depths, but give them in the in the proper order. If they have one of these very difficult samples, but they've got a trend uh, maturity above and below, they can, that will help them to select the right population of particles, of phytoclast, to measure for vitronite reflectance in those very difficult samples. And also supplement the reflectance with as much maturity uh, information as you can. TAI, Tmax, from uh, 
Rocky Val, also the nephilphenanthrene index, which we will talk about in the next slide. This now is not organic petrography. This is actually looking at an extract of the rock. You have to uh, establish that that extract is indigenous. It hasn't, it's not migrated oil. But if you can do that, uh, there are conversions, uh, methylphenanthrene in index to reflectance. Uh, this was uh, originally developed by Matthias Rodke uh, back in 1986. Since then, there have been uh, you know, improvements to this. There's a more recent approach by Chris Borum, an alternative calibration of the methylphenanthrene index against vitronite reflectance. Uh, I never really did get a chance to talk with Rodke, uh, with Matthias, about why he made the ratio look like this. You can see there's an issue here. We have the two and three methyl and anthrenes, which are uh, more stable than the one and nine, but the phenanthrene is more stable than those. So you've got stable compounds in the numerator and the denominator. Uh, but anyway, that's what they did. They, they made the methyl phenanthrene index that way. And uh, this is what the result is, probably because of that uh, uh, issue with uh, numerator and denominator. For a given methylphenanthrene index, you can have two different, entirely different levels of uh, reflectance, vitronite reflectance. Well, in most cases, you know pretty much which of these two arms you're on. So you can, uh, in many cases, use methylphenanthrene index to estimate uh, an equivalent vitronite reflectance and compare that to your measured reflectance to help confirm that reflectance value. So this is just another way of getting at the maturity of uh, your, your sample. This is a table I like to use, uh, but it's uh, like everything. It, it, there's some caveats that have to, be, uh, have to be monitored pretty carefully here. For example, here's a here are some maturation parameters. Reflectance, Tmax from Rocky Val and TAI. Here's some fluid measurements that give you a, more about the generation. Uh, let's look here. I've highlighted in red uh, most source rocks, many source rocks, early oil window is about 0.6, 0 0.65% reflectance. Yeah, uh, but if you'll recall just a few slides ago, I said mm, uh, maturation, generation, Maturation and generation are two very different things. So these are sliding scales. There are source rocks like the Miocene Monterey Formation. Generation begins at 0.4% reflectance. Uh, there are some uh, torbanites. There's a torbanite in Scotland that I'm aware of that doesn't really get to early generation until about 1% uh, reflectance. Uh, but most source rocks, this is a pretty good number, uh, there's also an organophasis variation in the Tmax. Uh, there's a range of values here. This is typical of the 445 is typical sometimes of some of these uh, almost uh, mono, monoclonal, uh, uh, monoculture uh, uh, type, uh, Hustrine type one carrigens that you see occasionally. But a lot of samples, 435 is a pretty good estimate of the beginning of the window. But again, keep that in mind. That's not generation, that's the vitronite reflectance scale. Um, now, this is also a useful uh, sort of uh, table to look at. If, for example, you had a measurement of 0.6% reflectance, but you had a Tmax of 450, you would know there's something wrong, right? Either one or both of those maturity measurements, uh, there's something wrong. So this is a way of checking uh, the validity of your measurements and seeing that they're consistent. Now, there have been publications out there. Uh, Dan Jarvie published uh, uh, a correlation here of vitronite reflectance against Tmax. And he did this innocently enough. He, was, he did this with a, he declared which uh, basins, which samples he used, which shales he used to generate this uh, correlation. But then the uh, a lot of people, a lot of geologists started using this in their basins. And uh, the unfortunate thing is that even within the maturation parameters, uh, there are sliding scales. This, this relationship worked for the samples that he used. In a later study, he had another calibration that uh, was based on other samples. This is a lot of data, but you gotta be really careful 
uh, about doing this to calculate an equivalent reflectance and compare your measured reflectance. Um, probably the best thing to do, and I mean, if I've had students come to me and say, well, I want to use the Jordi equation. I would say, no, don't do that. You have the data. You've got reflectance data and the corresponding Tmax data for your source rock or your basin, right, your basin. Use those to create your own calibration that you can use uh, then to compare uh, the, the reflectance that you measure with the equivalent reflectance from conversion of Tmax. All right, this is a real well. This is the Achillic River well in, uh, in Alaska. And this is, uh, this is where a geochemist comes in handy. Uh, here is what the model says. The model that was run, we had a 3D, 3D model, we ran it, and it says, well, the maturity, the reflectance based on the uh, uh, Burnham and Sweeney easy R naught should be about like this. Well, uh, two different labs had analyzed samples from this well and different reflectance. Here is one set of samples from that one lab, and, and lab number one changed their mind down here, and they've got reflectance up here. So maybe there's an unconformity here. I don't know. Uh, lab two has reflectance values like so. Okay, so who's right? You cannot tell. You cannot tell just from looking at these data. You need other independent measures of maturity to determine which one is right. And in both cases, neither one fits the present model. So this model is going to be adjusted. You're going to have to adjust that model either up to this or down to that. And uh, if this is correct, these guys here are correct, there's, there's something really interesting going on here. So this is, uh, this is where uh, uh, the geochemistry and uh, uh, looking at multiple maturity parameters comes in handy. A great way to do that is using geochemical logs. This is a geochemical log. If, you, if your company does not use geochemical logs, you might want to make yourself famous in your company by starting an electronic uh, 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 bibliography of uh, geochemical logs from different parts of the world. You can see here, this is mostly Rocky Val and TOC data. And there's some vitronite reflectance data in this well. And I want to just focus on the reflectance data here. Notice that uh, for the Rocky Val TOC, it's every 10 meters or so. And that's, that's what screening technology is all about. Some people try to save money by just running a few reflectance and uh, a, a few vitronite, ref uh, sorry, a few uh, uh, Rocky Val and TOC measurements. Well, that's silly because uh, uh, you you want to you want to use the power of all that data to create uh, this sort of a diagram that you can really pick out what's going on. So let's just look at the T max here from Rocky Bell. This is a pretty nice trend here. There's something funny going on here and here and here are the reflectance values. Uh, we don't do reflectance uh, at the same 10 meter interval. 10 meters, regardless of lithology for TOC and Rocky Bell. But for vitronite reflectance, it's a different story. We'll do vitronite reflectance in shales and even siltstones, but we avoid sandstones because the vitronite can be oxidized. And we avoid source rocks because of a thing called suppression that I'll describe here in just a moment. Here's a nice trend in reflectance that is supported by the Tmax trend. <coughs> and you can see here, We've got a nice trend and then a trend that continues down below, but this sample right here is anomalous. It is suppressed. And guess what? It's in a source rock, high total organic carbon and lots of hydrogen, a very high hydrogen index. That means there's a lot of liptonite in this sample. And this is a source rock. So they did a mistake here. They, they did vitronite reflectance within a source rock. The real maturity is over here somewhere. That's just one example of a geochemical log. And uh, you can see, I think, just from looking at it, how this could be used if you have multiple geochemical logs. You could do a lot in a basin for mapping the thickness of source rocks, the level of maturity in the source rocks, and so forth. OK, now I don't want to give the impression that I'm, uh, that I'm down on vitronite reflectance. I think it's a very powerful tool. But we have to be aware of the pitfalls. These are just some of the pitfalls, okay? Caving, 
you've got or organic matter caving down a, uh, a well bore that hasn't been uh, sealed off yet with cement, uh, you may get lower reflectance values because the petrographer is measuring uh, vitronite that's fallen down from a shallower zone. Same with rough vitronite, uh, grooves in the vitronite are gonna reduce the reflectance. Suppression, I just showed you uh, suppression. In a source rock that has a lot of liptonite, you're gonna get notorious for getting low uh, reflectance values. Mud contamination, usually lower. For example, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, there's a lot of drilling using uh, particulate additives like uh, lignite. It helps lubricate the bit. But what is lignite? It's, it's dominated by low maturity vitronite. Okay, so that will be, that'd be a problem for an interpreter to try to differentiate the indigenous from the contaminant. Oxidized vitronite. In a sandstone, the vitronite can be oxidized, and that's going to result in higher reflectance values if the vitronite is still there. Recycled or reworked material, yeah, that's going to be higher values because you're putting in material that maybe went through a previous uh, burial and maturation. Anisotropy, uh, you know, if you have a rotating stage, you can investigate that. Uh, but, you know, anisotropy, if you can't rotate the stage, you're going to get sort of an average value. But this can, this can affect things. Solid bitumen can sometimes be mistaken for vitronite. Uh, incorrect macerol identification. Well, it's not just solid bitumen. You can, you can identify the wrong macerol. It can be the wrong vitronite subgroup or maybe even another, maybe it's liptonite. Maybe it's inertonite that you've picked as a, uh, as the true vitronite. Natural variations among macerals. I showed you a nice slide of one nice particle of vitronite that actually shows some variations within that single vitronite phytoclast. And then statistical errors. Watch out for reflectance values that are determined on less than you know, 20 phytoclasts. You want, nominally, you want about 100 phytoclast measurements uh, to be statistically, uh, at least statistically uh, valid. Another way of, of approaching this is uh, to create a reflectogram rather than a histogram, a reflectogram. This is best done with an automated system because what you're doing is you're measuring every single particle, every single organic particle. You're screening out the, the uh, epoxy, of course, but you're measuring the reflectance of every particle in the slide. Now, uh, some of these automated systems can do millions and millions of pixels. And so it's a very statistical uh, look at uh, the, all of the different populations of macerals in there. The problem is <clears throat> those macerals don't come labeled. <laughs> so, you know, here's an interpretation. We're interpreting that this is cave material. Here's some caving going on, yeah. Uh, this is recycled material, yeah, uh, from a previous uh, burial. Uh, it's washing into the basin. And here's maybe some indigenous vitronites that have uh, you know, different properties, different, different levels of maturity. Uh, you, wanna, you wanna look at those carefully too and try to differentiate between them. Now, some of my students have had difficulties with difficult samples and uh, one approach uh, that doesn't involve a, uh, uh, something that measures millions of pixels is uh, Jane Newman has an approach that she calls the vitronite inertonite reflectance and fluorescence uh, diagram. And so what she does is she measures the reflectance, but she also measures fluorescence. And these, all these measurements were made on one sample. This is one of these really tough samples. You can see a tremendous variation in the reflectance of the particles. The fluorescence is a giveaway though. Fluorescent uh, vitronite is what we call perhydrous vitronite. That's going to be suppressed vitronite. That's going to give you suppressed reflectance values, okay, because it fluoresces under UV excitation. Here's maybe some uh, caved vitronite. Here's some uh, reworked vitronite. Here's some inertonite. And here maybe is the, is the true vitronite population. This is a tough sample, obviously, uh, but this is one approach to get at that. Uh, here's the uh, example of uh, uh, poor versus good polish. Preparation of the sample is important. If you don't use a fine enough grit, you end up with grooves in the surface of the vitronite, which reduces the reflectance. 
this is an observation that has been around for a long time. Many people have observed this, and we just observed it in that geochemical log. We uh, had a liptonite rich unit that uh, was a source rock, evidently, and the reflectance was suppressed. And so way back in 1980, Hutton observed this. He looked at a whole bunch of different oil shales, and he was able to show that, gee, the volume of liptonite, the more liptonite, the more suppressed the vitronite value ends up being. Now, uh, there's sort of three explanations for this that grew out of uh, these observations. And those explanations have literally been around for more than 40, 50 years uh, without any real resolution as to what, uh, what uh, if, if any of these actually are, are functioning. Um, diagenetic perhydrous vitronite, that is maybe, a, maybe in an organic rich oil cone, liptonite rich source rock deposited under anoxic conditions, you form a vitronite, a perhydrous vitronite, that just follows a different pathway. It starts off being suppressed because of the diagenetic conditions. Uh, another explanation might be, well, this is overpressure. Some of these, uh, some of these highly overpressured rocks, the reflectance may be retarded. Uh, uh, we can talk about that at some point if you're interested, but uh, that's, that's uh, one explanation. Uh, another explanation is that volatiles generated from the liptonite actually combine with uh, the, the vitronite, or basically impregnate the vitronite and reduce its uh, reflectance. So uh, these, have, these have been around a long time. It's always good to have multiple explanations and then uh, try to isolate variables and find out what's really the, uh, what's really the principle that's being employed. This is from uh, Price and Barker, who made a, wrote a paper on suppression uh, early on. Um, here they have uh, measures, measurements of vitronite, quite a few measurements here. Nice trend and reflectance up here. This is the Otter Formation, and then they go into the Bakken Formation in the Williston Basin here. Bakken is liptonite rich. It's a very oil prone uh, shale, uh, car carbonate rich shale, and it's uh, mudstone. And it, uh, when you get into that, of course, the, you see this very strong suppression. The reflectance or the equivalent reflectance should be really over here if you extrapolate that trend. Okay. Uh, now, Mike Lewin at the U.S. Geological Survey did a whole series of hydrous pyrolysis experiments. These are experiments at various isothermal temperatures, right? Each each is a closed system. And he started with some unheated samples of humic coal, different coals, very rich in vitronite, and then some of these uh, other source rocks like the Phosphoria, the Alum Shale, and the Woodford that are basically loaded with liptonite. And he saw basically he could recreate these uh, very different pathways. This is a suppressed trend that you see with these liptonite rich sources. And this is the, the normal humic trend that you see with, uh, you know, basically humic coal vitronite rich coal. And uh, despite these observations, Lewin concluded that the reflectance suppression is not caused by the presence of oil generated from the liptonite. So he more or less excluded that third explanation uh, and thought that it was more of a diagenetic effect. Well, we actually uh, decided to uh, avoid this kind of experiment because this doesn't really isolate variables. If you start with samples that have different vitronites in them to start with, you can't really isolate the variables and, and evaluate whether it's a, a suppression of the vitronite by, by liptonite. So what we did in a, in a paper that we published in 2018, I think finally resolves this issue about uh, uh, suppression with liptonite. We took basically a liptonite rich kerogen that we isolated from the Green River Formation. It has virtually no vitronite in it. It's very uh, hydrogen rich, oil prone, liptonite rich kerogen. And we mixed it with a coal, a humic coal that was dominated by vitronite. Okay, and very little liptonite in that coal, essentially zero liptonite in the coal. And we mixed them together in artificial rock that we created. We, we write up how to make artificial rock in our paper. And so it was kind of a unique and uh, uh, 
I think, pretty elegant way of approaching this question. And we, we mixed these together and made artificial rock, compressed them into little rock uh, uh, wafers, and then we heated those under hydrous pyrolysis conditions. And you can see here is 0, 0,100. Well, that's zero liptonite rich kerogen, 100% coal. And you see the trend here. This is the unheated sample. Yep, 300, 320, or 330. And then there's 350. And then 50 50. And here's 90% liptonite with some small amounts of vitronite in there. You can see the suppression. Okay, and it's outside the air bar here. This is clearly suppression. That's a result of the liptonite uh, impregnating the, the vitronite with uh, volatile products. Um, yeah, this is a, this is a wonderful uh, experiment. I think that worked out very nicely, and, but it does not exclude those other mechanisms I described. Uh, I, I have some doubts about those other mechanisms, but this uh, isolated variables and shows that this mechanism certainly does work is uh, liptonite suppresses the reflectance. Um, now, here's a, a nice figure from Allen and Allen, and it shows uh, a normal sort of sublinear change of reflectance with depth, uh, sort of monotonic burial. Here, is, uh, here are two geotherms. Here's a, some sort of thermal perturbation, like an intrusion or something at depth. Uh, here's, a, here's an unconformity. You see a nice trend here, and then there's another trend that's broken. So there's missing section right here. These are, of course, very important things to know uh, in creating your model. You want to look at this kind of data right here. You've lost section. That rock that's missing here because of that unconformity, of course, had an effect on the maturity of the rocks and the geohistory of the rocks below it. And uh, you need to define not only how much was lost, but what its lithology was, what its thermal conductivity was, because that's going to affect the maturation of those sediments. And also here's uplift. Of course, it's not going to change. With uplift, the reflectance will be preserved because it's an irreversible reaction. So here's a, here's a little quiz. Uh, remember, uh, multiple, you know, multiple possible explanations for everything. Uh, this is from the Western Desert in Egypt, and you can see vitronite reflectance plot, plotted against depth. First thing you might want to say is, well, there's an unconformity here. Uh, it turns out that's a good guess, but uh, no, that's not actually what the case is. And here you want to be like a detective. You want to have as much information as you can get about the well. So getting the well log report, the report of the well turned out to be very critical uh, in this well. Another explanation uh, might be that there's a large normal fault here. And uh, we basically cut out uh, some missing section because of that. But really, what actually happened in this well is that at 11,500 feet, they set casing. Above this, uh, before they set the casing, this was an open hole. And it was pretty incompetent uh, rock, some incompetent rock layers up above here that were dropping uh, low maturity vitronite into the well. And it, uh, this, the, those, that low vitronite, that alloclinous vitronite was coming up with the vitronite from the burial, from the depth of the bit. And so these are all uh, spurious, they're erroneous reflectance values that are uh, basically measurements of the, uh, this uh, sloughing material that came in as the, uh, as the, as the cuttings uh, were, were retrieved. Uh, below that depth, once they, set, once they set casing, there was no more caving. These are now good reflectance values. So, you know, getting access to the well logs is important in many cases. Here's a classic paper from Wally Dow in 1977. A lot of people use this, but I would caution you, you got to be a little careful. What he says is, okay, I've, I've got a nice reflectance profile here. Wow, that's a lot of reflectance values in a pretty short burial depth here. Normally, we're talking about 200 meters, 250, 250 meters between reflectance values, because it takes time to do these. Um, and we've got uh, then uh, what looks like an unconformity, because we've got another trend right here. Uh, and there's looks like there's missing section here. Of course, that's important to know for your model. And so uh, the tendency would be, well, we'll draw a line here. We'll extrapolate it up to there. And we'll say, oh, that's 500 meters of lost section. 
well, this is the graphical approach to doing this. There's some limitations to doing that uh, described in a paper by Barry Katz. Uh, but this, you've got to be careful here, but this is, this is really the minimum amount of erosion because of a thing called annealing. With further burial and maturation, time and temperature is going to tend to make these two curves coalesce into one. So this will get to be smaller and smaller and smaller with further burial and maturation, right? Uh, so this is a minimum amount of erosion. Uh, this is one of many ways of getting at lost section. You can compare, for example, uh, this section with a complete section somewhere else in the basin. You can project uh, the uplifted shale sonic transit times on the typical uh, transit time versus depth curve for that uh, particular shale. Uh, you can extrapolate semi-log sonic transit times versus depth to the uncompacted shale value. Yeah, and there, you know, this is a uh, this is, there are different ways of doing it, but this is a way of doing it with organic petrography, but be careful, it's the minimum amount that's been lost. Okay, here's a, here's a slide that uh, shows something that you will see some places in the world, it's actually fairly common, uh, is a dog leg. This is a linear scale on the right, I'm gonna show you the uh, normal semi-log scale. You can still see this dog leg. Uh, you see a nice trend, in the, in the reflectance values, and then poof, all of a sudden, it takes off. Now, we, uh, we had built a full 3D model of this part of the North Slope uh, in, uh, in some basin modeling software, and uh, we uh, could not explain this change in gradient right here. You, you might say, well, there's a different thermal gradient here, and something big happened right here. We couldn't explain anything uh, on this from the geohistory tectonics uh, to explain this change in uh, the slope. What this is, and I will discuss this in much more detail in the section on kinetics, uh, this has to do with the kinetic transformation of bitronite. Once it runs out of hydrogen, the bitronite goes from more, uh, from more of sp3 type covalent bonds to sp2 type covalent bonds, and there's a reorganization of the bitronite where the reflectance goes up at a faster rate. So this, is, uh, this has nothing to do, in this case, with uh, a change in thermal gradient. You've got to distinguish that from cases where this is actually, you see a dog leg and it's actually because of a change in thermal gradient. That's, uh, that takes some geology. Okay, well, I've got uh, an answer to an exercise that uh, I gave you uh, at the end of the first lecture. This is now the second lecture, and I've sort of made a composite figure here of depth versus reflectance. So this is uh, in, including a bunch of things that I've seen through uh, different experiences through time. And I ask you to try to describe A, B, C, D, E, and F, right? What's going on? Well, actually A is not all that unusual in places like the North Slope of Alaska. Uh, this is actually, uh, this is actually uh, caused by uh, recycled vitronite from erosion of highlands surrounding this tertiary basin. In uh, the North Slope, you have a big tertiary basin with Mesozoic highlands. And those Mesozoic highlands, the vitronite has been uh, already undergone maturation. So this is washing into the basin. So we have a lochthanus, a lochthanus vitronite washing into the basin. And the organic petrographer is just measuring what they think is the vitronite. Well, in fact, the true vitronite has been swamped. It's only a small uh, proportion compared to the total amount of recycled vitronite. And in fact, sometimes you get vertical profile, sometimes they're inverted like this. So this is uh, spurious because of recycled vitronite. Now in B, we basically have a nice trend in some or organic lean shales. Uh, here's a possible uh, oxidized vitronite phytoclast. Uh, that's a little bit off here, but it, it may be a sandstone interval that it was oxidized. Uh, this is a good, a good lean, organic lean shale. Now here in C, we have what looks like mild suppression of the vitronite reflectance. This could be, you have to look at the geochemical log at the other data, the Rocky Val data, the hydrogen index, the TOC, but I would suspect that this would be a, a source rock interval with a, a lot of liptonite in that source rock. So we're, we're seeing suppression here from uh, 
generation of volatiles that are interfering with the reflectance uh, pathway, the normal reflectance pathway of the vitronite. Now in D, you're seeing a continuation of the trend in, in B. Yeah, we've got some low reflecting values here. Maybe these are solid bitumen, possibly misidentified as uh, vitronite. Sometimes solid bitumen can be mistaken for vitronite. Uh, from D to E, wow, that's, uh, that could be an unconformity. That's something you want to really pay attention to and uh, look at the geology, see if it makes sense, and then reconstruct what was lost to get that into your basin model and account for that in your basin model. Notice the steeper thermal gradient below the unconformity as opposed to above, it's slightly steeper. And of course, here at E to F, we have this dog leg. Uh, again, this could be due to uh, some sort of change in geothermal gradient or something, but it may also be due to this reorganization of the vitronite from dominantly SP3 hybridized to SP3, SP2 hybridized uh, sort of polyaromatic uh, sheets. So here are the answers. Uh, these are not the ultimate answers, of course. There's never an ultimate answer. There, there are hypotheses. So these are the explanations for those kinds of observations. And you want to go and, and look and find other evidence to support those. OK, so we want to talk a little bit about conclusions here. Uh, we've talked about a lot of material in the last few minutes. Terrigen consists of mass rolls having different origins, generative potential and reflectance. The reflectance is affected by lots of things, and you need to be aware of that. Polish, right, the, the preparation of the sample, stage rotation, anisotropy, yeah, uh, over about 1% reflectance, those vitronite particles become anisotropic. Recycling, right, oxidation, suppression, incorrect mass roll identification, Hey, monitor the number of phytoclasts that have been measured too. Don't just take that reflectance out of a table and use it. You need to know, uh, you need to know more about the, 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 what the histogram looks like and how many samples were actually measured. Assess maturity using multiple parameters. These are maturity parameters, things like reflectance, TAI, Tmax, methylphenantrine index, and comparisons of shallower and deeper trends, right? If you've got shallower and deeper trends, and you've got a very difficult sample that's intermediate between those, that will help the petrographer, it will help you to decide what the true vitronite is in that sample to complete that trend. Provide the analyst with the depth order of the samples, that is a good idea. Maturity, things like reflectance, and generation parameters, they're sliding scales. A generation parameter would be like the transformation ratio, right? or the production index, right? Uh, that's another measurement. Uh, these are sliding scales that vary from carriage to carriage, and because the kinetics are different. The reflectance at the top of the oil window, say 10% reflectance at the beginning of the oil window, might range from 0.4 to 1%. Usually it's about 0.6%, as in that table that I showed you. But you know, in the model ray formation, it's about 0.4. And in some of these torbanites that I've seen, it's like 1%. Okay. Correlations among maturity parameters, even among the maturity parameters, also vary from carriage to carriage. So yes, uh, Jarvie's uh, equation was useful for that particular set of samples, that particular set of source rocks. Uh, it's best to determine your own relationship if you want to extrapolate Tmax to predict reflectance and compare with measured reflectance. Discontinuous reflectance trends can indicate the minimum eroded thickness, okay? And that's uh, very useful and important for your basin model. Dog legs in the reflectance versus depth may be caused by reorganization of the vitronite after hydrogen depletion that is unrelated to a change in geothermal gradient. Okay. Here are, again, this, these are uh, abbreviated lectures. Uh, this is, again, now uh, just a few references that I think are going to be useful for you to better understand uh, mass rolls and uh, vitronite reflectance. It is a powerful technique, but it can be misused uh, very easily. There are lots of pitfalls you need to be aware of uh, in your uh, application to basin modeling.
The next set of lectures are going to be on Rocky valve pyrolysis and total organic carbon before we get on to uh, pyrolysis. Uh, that is another, another uh, third set of six lectures that we'll be providing. And uh, I hope you're looking forward to that. This is now a figure that I'd like you to consider that we're going to show uh, the answers to the question here in the next lecture. So here, uh, you want to define uh, these different depth intervals, what they actually represent. You know, where are the source rocks? What about the quantity, quality, and maturity of those source rocks, right? And what about the maturity measurements, right? So uh, this, is a, this is a geochemical log. These are very, very useful. And uh, you, wanna, you wanna be able to use these if you have them, uh, you wanna be able to use these to look at your data at the same time. Okay, well, that uh, pretty much concludes the lecture for today. Um, I look forward to uh, seeing you at the next lecture. Thanks very much.